or just to finish uh, the discussion of uh, last hour, what should be the distance we arrange our receiving antennas? We have two antennas with two receivers. And here I select the best possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, what is the best <coughs> distance between these two antennas? Or how large should it be? It uh, depends on what kind of propagation we have in front of our antennas. Say, if we know that the field in the vertical direction So this is electric field, and this is height above ground. If the field in the vertical direction has some kind of period, it, change, it changes periodically. What uh, distance now makes sense? It makes sense a distance, so if we, but we do not know the exact uh, height above ground of this pattern. Uh, we remember we got such a pattern, uh, the reflection from ground. Uh, what is now the optimum distance? So if one antenna is on the maximum, the other should be on the minimum. So this is actually our optimum distance. So correlated reception. Correlated fields. Also, uh, if D is sufficiently small, but we know approximately the period of fading of the field as a function of height above the ground, we can simply take it half of the period. The, the best di di uh, distance should be if now we have a correlated reception. Uh, so if one drops into the minimum, the other one is at the maximum, and we can make the optimum choice. Uh, on many occasions, we do not know this period exactly, but on some occasions, when we know what is the propagation, where is the reflection of the reflected signal, we may know this, and sometimes it makes, makes sense to have the reception correlated. Like a point-to-point -point link, we know what is about the height of these antennas above ground. We can calculate this period out of similar, simple formulas, and we install our, our receiver space vertically at different uh, Yes. Uh, for uh, larger, so d much larger, uh, d much larger than uh, than this uh, uh, d correlated, uh, will be d uncorrelated. Then the two antennas will be uncorrelated, and if the distance, if we can afford such a distance that the pattern is uncorrelated. What can we do up here? One possibility was the switch. If I have uh, E1 here and E2 here, I could uh, now plot a diagram of E1 and E2. And I have the minimum E1 for reception as one direction, E minimum one, and I have an E minimum two in this direction. Uh, so in this uh, pattern, I have both here. Uh, in this region here, E minimum 2, I forgot to write here. In this region here, uh, Rx1 is out. In this region here, Rx number 2 is out. Rx number 2 is out. And here, both are out. So 
So if they are uncorrelated, uh, if this is, uh, I have the probability uh, out one, and here I have the probability out two. If this here are uncorrelated, one and two uncorrelated, it means large D. This means that the total probability uh, of outage is now the product of the two probabilities, probability of the outage of for the first link uh, times probability the outage of the second link. This is a very simple calculation. If they are uncorrelated, if they are spaced enough, not if I have them correlated here. So this is the simple calculation. How, what do we expect from my diversity reception? And in fact, if this was 1%, this was 1%, this is 10 to the minus 4. So this is very, very low. But we still, we can do better than that. What can we do better than that? We could uh, use, in place of the switch, we could optimize, uh, optimally uh, uh, connect, uh, assemble the signals coming from both antennas. So I have E1 here, E2 here. I have two amplifiers. No modulation yet. A1, A2. And I have a variable phase shifter. And then I sum both signals and get the result. Now if I make such optimal uh, optimal combining, I still get something, I still some, get some advantage. And that advantage can be plotted here as a circle. So both are still out in this area here. But this very small area here is gained by the optimal combining. So if we use optimal com combining in, in place of simply selecting the best possible output, we can do actually better. And there is a small difference between the two because here, uh, link one is out alone, link two is out alone, but the optimal, optimum, optimum su su sum of both, uh, of both it's, it's uh, useful. So this is uh, uh, optimal combining can provide us a small advantage uh, in the reception inside here. Uh, optimal combining is used in some occasions, but uh, it is not that easy to do this, this because you have to adjust the gains of both amplifiers and you also have to adjust the phase to have the, uh, the correct phasor sum to get most of the signal because uh, uh, here we think as noise being uncorrelated between the two antennas while signal is correlated between the two antennas and that's the, that's the reason why we are doing this. So this is just, just to end up the discussion about uh, about, uh, about uh, diversity reception. We can do this uh, in some systems. We can do it like UMTS can do it uh, on the signal processing level. So we don't see it. We just have one antenna, one receiver. In, in reality, inside, we have optimum combining of different signals. This can be done. This can be done in some systems, but it's not that frequent. Uh, this is perhaps the easiest to understand, just selecting the uh, optimum output, but the, then we lose this small orange section in here. This is just to conclude the discussion of from the previous hour. Now uh, let's see how to make our network. Uh, how to build a network? Have a base station. transmitting some useful information to our user. It has the radio for the correct frequency. 
And this is actually what I have to decide while, while designing a station uh, network. What is now the useful range, D useful here? But at a certain distance, I have to repeat the same frequency because frequencies cost money. That's uh, the usual way to earn taxes by many, many governments in the world, by taxing frequencies. So I have to reuse the same frequency to make the maximum profit from the frequency I have to pay for. So at, the, at a certain distance, I have the base station that repeats exactly the same frequency. So here I have also F1, but this F1 is communicating with another user. It's sending out other information. So uh, what uh, I have here, I have uh, here, I have this distance here is distance from the interference. Now, what can I plot about the signals? If I plot signals le signal levels here, power, and this is horizontal distance, say, this is x. My useful signal is maximum at the location of the transmitter here and drops down. The interference signal has some similar behavior. So I didn't write this. Uh, it's not, not a good drawing. Just, just I have to correct it. It's not a good drawing for the things I want to show here. Uh, right. Uh, the interference signal has a similar behavior. It's a similar base station with a similar peak and a sim similar, sim sim similar, very similar behavior of the signal power here. This is uh, P interference and this is uh, useful power. So at my useful range here, I should define what is now the ratio between the two. The ratio of the P useful over P interference. Uh, this should be above a certain value to make the things work. And in this way, I can decide at what distance I should install. I could install the next base station using the same frequency channel, not to interfere with this one, if I know this value here. So uh, the first thing in a mobile environment, I should look at uh, what, 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 is the, uh, uh, what is the expected received power. The expected received power is proportional to, okay, transmit power, Power. And the power in the receiver is proportional to the transmit power, certainly is proportional to the antennas, uh, but is inversely, inversely proportional to the distance, distance to the minus n. Uh, you remember when we talked about the reflection of ground, we saw that n was minus 4. Uh, so this n actually goes between 3 and 5, where 4 is the more, most, most frequent uh, formula we get also from measurement. So measurement agree with, with the reflection of ground for urban, urban, environment, urban environment like towns. Uh, we can see what will be the expected signal level. Now we need to know what is the P useful against P interference and what does this ratio include. The signal to noise ratio P signal to, 
is around 10 for all known communication systems, for GSM phones, for instance, also for frequency modulated analog radio, also for more complex mobile phones we have nowadays. We need a signal to noise ratio of at least 10. Better if we have method, but, but 10 with at least, at least what we need. And uh, further, we see that uh, we should consider, uh, so this is actually, if I write it here, this is actually what we need to our actual signal. This is signal to noise ratio, uh, P noise, sorry, P noise here, signal to noise ratio. Further, we need some margin for fading. Uh, so this, uh, if I write equate now the equations, p useful to p uh, interference. What is the required p useful to p interference? Is now uh, a p signal against p noise, the minimum signal to interference ratio. This is this thing here, and we need some margin for fading. And the margin for fading here is uh, uh, average power to the minimum power, if you remember this from last time. Since we have some Rayleigh fading. What are now the expected values? So this is... Uh, uh, this ratio uh, signal to noise is around 10 and this say maybe around 100. 100 uh, if we expect this means uh, this ratio 100 means uh, P outage uh, around 1% and this makes sense. So this thing here the whole calculation is around 1000. We need a useful power to the interferer, power of around 1000. Where we get this 1000? P useful to P interferer. If we use this formula here, P useful to P interferer is now D useful to D interferer to the, to what power? D useful, D useful to interferer to the minus nth power. If I divide uh, two equations together. Uh, so this is actually, usually this is uh, d useful to d interferer to the minus fourth power. Or in other words, uh, this is uh, uh, d interferer to d useful to the fourth power if I flip around the and this should be around 1000 we plug in the value 1000 here uh, so what is now at what distance I could install an interfering station using the same frequency well I can calculate this the interfere to the user the user is now the fourth root of uh, P user to P interference. It's the fourth root of 1000. Fourth root of 1000. Now the square root of 1000 is around 30. The square root of 30 is around 5.5. So this is around five and a half. This is now our link calculation. What does that mean in practice? How should I design my network now? I should keep uh, the interfering stations far enough considering that I have a useful range here. I could obtain this useful range just for the signal levels, 
uh, I know the minimum power of the receiver, what power do I need, actually need in the receiver, considering also the fading, but the minimum power is known. No? Uh, and uh, what signal to noise ratio I need? Okay, but, but that's already in the minimum power. Uh, so, uh, first design the network for a useful range. This was given initially for GSM, for the GS system, GSM systems. Th this was intended as three kilometers. Now it's less than that. As uh, the network grow denser, then uh, this uh, distance is shrinking here. Uh, so, let's see what I can do here now trying to plot a map of uh, such a network. So I have my useful station, has a certain range. Now this is the top view of the map with a transmitter at frequency 1 here. Now this map, uh, this uh, circle mm -hmm. has a diameter of the useful range of this radio trans transmitter. Now of course the, in the neighboring circle I should not use the same frequency. The neighboring circle should use frequency number two. Frequency number two, still with the same useful coverage, but this that does not interfere with frequency one because there are different frequencies, different channels. And then I put here frequency three. Again with the same useful range, the useful. Uh, on a third frequency, now what is the distance? Now it's one, two, three, four, five. At five distances, well, the exact calculation is 5.5. By my, my rounding now this figure to five, it will not be as good as with 5.5. Here I could already receive uh, the, uh, the next base station using the same frequency. So here I I'm just uh, making a dotted circle here uh, with the same D useful. And this is again at the same frequency F1. Sorry, these circles are not, they are not all of the same size. I should have plotted them of the same size. So, in this case, what I have here, I have, uh, I'm just trying to plot distances now. Here I have the useful, and here I have the interference. It's all the way from here. And now the interference over the useful is here equal to 5 in this one. It's slightly less than uh, uh, five and a half what we got here from our approximate calculation. But uh, this means that we have to accept a little bit uh, uh, worse uh, signal to noise ratio or some more frequent, uh, some more frequent uh, dropouts of the link, but not much than 1%, maybe 2%. Still useful. Now, this is for one dimension, but our map of our country does not have one dimension. It has two dimensions. The map is flat, has two dimensions. So, in the other dimension, I can put here a transmitter on frequency F4. And this transmitter has this range here. F4. And further, I continue building my network. I can put here a transmitter 
on the frequency F5. And next, I can put a transmitter here on the frequency F6. Uh, after F6, I can go with again with F4. So F4 could be the same frequency repeated here, F4. Further plotting uh, circles in the same direction. I still need <coughs> additional frequencies. I still need additional frequencies. For instance, here I draw now a circle for uh, F7. Uh, I may have F8 here. This should actually touch, this circle should touch everyone. Circle should touch. Uh, I have F8. And finally, I have F9. After this, I can repeat frequencies. Say, down here, you see, I can put a circle, the coverage of the next F1. The coverage of the next F1 comes here. And this F1 is far enough from this F1, and it is far enough from this F1. So not to have interference. Uh, I can also have here an F2, an additional F2 here. The draw, my drawing is very nice, not very nice because I'm running out of space. And another one F3 here. Three, and so on. Uh, this kind of assigning frequencies was uh, well known for many, many years ago. Maybe at least uh, 60 or 70 years was known. And in fact, uh, frequencies of tra uh, various transmitters to avoid interference were assigned according to such a map and knowing the equation governing the propagation of radio waves. This is usually the fourth power here. Uh, for links with uh, reflection of ground is usually fourth power. It can be different from different links because at large distances uh, calculations may be different, like the curvature of the Earth. Uh, like free space propagation when n is just equal to 2, uh, with the curvature of um, the Earth, the uh, pro, uh, power is larger than 4. So uh, we can adapt this system for any possible combination. Here uh, I tried to plot the example for the most popular link. Most popular link is uh, mobile phones that require a signal to noise ratio of around 10 and say around maybe 1% or maybe 2% of outages of these links. This is a typical figure. These are the typical figures for mobile links. We see how many frequencies, different channels we need. We need uh, nine different channels. Also, this, this one down here could be nine. This one could be nine. And... Uh, uh, F3, F3, this was 3. 3, sorry, uh, I made a mistake. 3, F9, uh, no, not this one here, sorry. This could be F3, F3, sorry for the mistake. This one is 3. 3, 3, 3, 3. Uh, 9 is here. 9 is here. here. I can cover, cover the, an arbitrary large area using the same system for assigning frequencies. So F4 is here, F5, F6 could be here. Here could be 6. Could have 6 here. I'm just writing the numbers here. Now for practical purposes, the coverage of, if we want to cover the whole area, not just circles, it makes sense to 
uh, replace these circles, coverage circles, with uh, hexagons. So to have this circle here replaced with a hexagon like this one here. And of course, the next circle has its own hexagon. So they are not circles, they are simply replaced by hexagons because the result is almost the same. And so on. So if I draw a blue hexagon here. And the black one here. So it makes sense to divide now the space not in uh, circular areas but in hexagonal areas because with hexagonal areas I have no, no loss here, no surface loss. I cover hexagons can be arranged together uh, to completely cover the surface to have a coverage everywhere. And this is the reason the real root of the uh, cellular network. So this is a cell, and this is a cellular network, and cells are of hexagonal shapes if they are arranged one close to another. This is just one possibility to have nine different channels. If you need uh, different ratios here of uh, power, to inter power to noise, signal, signal to noise ratio, or uh, probability of dropouts, uh, such, uh, such networks with hexagons can be built with different number of differing channels. There is also such a network for just seven channels, there is a network for 19 channels, there are different possible combinations. But all follow the same rule and always if we have the possibility to install transmitters at particular sites well chosen exactly in the center of our defined area, then this hexagonal rule is the one that's most practical uh, to be used. In, practical, in the practical world. Uh, this is where the uh, word cellular radio comes from. So cellular radio comes from this. Because they, they, uh, these uh, frequency cells uh, have the same shape as the cells of uh, Honeywell. The same with what honey bees are doing in, the, in their nests uh, to fill, fill the complete area. Uh, a little bit strange expression, cellular radio, but it's frequently used and how it, it comes from this division. And this division of cells has two roots, has the required signal to, uh, to interference ratio and has the required fading probability of uh, outage of a link due to relay fading. So this is to conclude uh, the discussion about uh, the discussion today, the discussion about fading. Where does this fading really come in, in our calculation? We can increase the power of our station accordingly to get enough power, but this is not enough. We have to also take care of the interference. Uh, this calculation was done for the same height of the towers. Of course, also in our formula here, we could add additional terms when we have uh, uh, this formula, if it were uh, simplified, we could uh, also be multiplied here by the height of the transmitter squared, height of the receiver squared. Well, for the users, we know how tall they are. For the transmitters, we can select the same size of towers. But it's very important to keep the same size for the whole network. If we have a taller mountain, in this range here. We should not install a transmitter on that mountain because if we install a transmitter on a very tall tower or a mountain, then we have a much longer range. That transmitter is going to interfere with transmitters much further away. So it is not always simple to design such a network on a real, a real landscape from a map because, uh, okay, if your land is flat, then it's very easy. But if your land is not flat, 
if it has mountains, then you have careful what to put in the mountain. Of course, if you install a taller transmitter, we can say replace this transmitter on frequency 8 here. We can replace with an, an additional frequency, say F number 10, number 10. We could put it on a taller tower and have a larger coverage if we incident, accidentally need larger coverage from this location here. But uh, cellular radio transmitters are usually, usually not installed on mountains. Wherever you look on mountains, you see any kind of antennas, but not cellular phones. Because cellular phones, we have to be very careful not to increase too much the radio range of our transmitter. Uh, of course, there are other possibilities what we can do the, in these uh, cells. If we have a more densely populated cell, so uh, F10 here was used as an umbrella cell. This is usually called an umbrella cell that has a much larger, larger coverage from a taller tower or from a mountain top if this is required. On the other hand, we may have densely populated areas. And in a densely populated area, we may split a cell into sectors. So such a cell like this one here might be split into several sectors. Like, like in three sectors here. So we say, have, say, sector 11 here, sector 12, sector 13 here. Three additional channels, but we can provide better coverage with sector antennas on the same tower. And this is what is also usually done with uh, cellular towers. They have, uh, because cellular tower cost, costs money. They cost real estate to put on. Um, they cost equipment, they cost power. And it's better to have one cell split into many subcells, into many sectors, like three sectors. This is the other possibility. So one is the umbrella cell. It has a wider coverage. Or I may have sectors here. This is also a possibility when you are designing such a network and trying to adjust your network to the actual needs because this, this may be the town center when you have lots of communication. This may be somewhere in the forest where no one is using cellular phones. So this can be adjusted. Always still considering that the ground is almost flat, that we have the same equation for propagation. Uh, you can use the same approximation for the propagation of the, our radio signals. Okay, uh, that's almost all for today. So for next time, we are left with the final discussions in this course. I hope I told everything today. I tried to be a little bit shorter here.